Family Policy Alliance. My name is Joseph Combe. I'm the Director of Policy at Family Policy Alliance, or FPA as we call it, and I will be your host today. Recently, you might have seen the news that a Catholic family in Indiana had one of its children removed from the parent's custody because of dispute over the child's pronouns. That family has now appealed the litigation surrounding this issue to the Supreme Court of the United States. Joining us today to talk about it is my colleague and friend, Josh Hirschberger from the Indiana Family Institute where he serves as general counsel. Josh, welcome to the show. Thank you for joining us to talk about this important subject. No, great to be on and thank you for the opportunity to raise awareness about this very important case. No, you're welcome. We're the ones honored to have you on the show and just grateful for your expertise and your on the ground knowledge there in Indiana. So you heard me kind of summarize this case at, uh, during our introduction. Um, a Catholic family had one of its children removed because of some sort of dispute around the child's pronouns. Um, there's been, we've, I feel like we've heard rumors and, and news about different instances like that, but here you have a family actively involved in litigation and they've appealed what's going on in this litigation to the Supreme Court of the United States. So tell us, Josh, um, give us more details on the story, first of all, and, and what led to the legal dispute. Absolutely. And, and just to headline the case, I, I do think this is the nightmare case that we have all feared. We, we recognize that the sexual revolution has moved from kind of an acceptance phase to more of an enforcement phase. Uh, not only do you, you have to just agree with us, no, if, if you don't, there will be consequences. And, and we recognize if the state were to equate any hesitancy to affirm a child in their preferred pronouns or their transgender identity, if they equated that to neglect or abuse, then the full machinery of our juvenile courts of child welfare procedures would come to bear. And that's exactly what happened in this case. So a little bit of background, Mary and Jeremy Cox, and they have, they've published their names. They've been married for about 25 years. And Mary has a master's of science degree in biochemistry and molecular biology. And Jeremy works as a software engineer. Uh, they're, they love each other. They have a great family. They, they find a lot of joy and raising their children according to their beliefs. And I can certainly attest to them just having a, a beautiful home and, and loving that in interaction with their children. In 2019, uh, their son came to them and declared that he was a girl. Now, because of their faith, they believe that we are created immutably male or female, and that referring to a child according to a pronoun or name inconsistent with their biological sex is not best for them. So this was certainly according to their beliefs, but also to their research as to what was best for their child. So they did everything they could uh, to work through this disagreement, even using a nickname for their child. Um, but unfortunately, there, a report was made uh, to the Department of Child Services uh, that they were, were harming or neglecting their child because they were not, in fact, referring uh, to him using his preferred name and pronoun. Now, prior to uh, DCS, our Department of Child Services, the Child Welfare Agency here in Indiana getting involved, the parents had also um, watched an issue with eating, concerned a little bit about the child's weight, but they were following their doctor's recommendation, and they had actually already set an appointment with a specialist prior to the state getting involved in their family. So as I mentioned, in 2021, um, DCS, the Department of Child Services, investigated their home because they were not uh, they, and could not in good conscience refer to him using a name or pronoun inconsistent with his biological sex. At the initial hearing, DCS argued, and this is about a biological male, here was the argument, she should be in a home where she is accepted for who she is. Now, despite the parents providing evidence that they were caring for all of their child's physical, medical, and mental health needs, the trial court removed that child from their home and to make it worse, the trial court barred them from speaking on the entire topic of sex and gender. This would include their religious beliefs about sex and gender, and then placed the child in a home with a specific qualification. That home must verbally affirm or refer to that child using that preferred name and preferred pronoun. This, of course, just stunned the parents. The constitutional violations were just stacking up at this point. And so that was the initial removal in 2021. I might pause there, uh, Joseph, you had a follow-up, but that's essentially how this case developed. And that, again, is that nightmare scenario. And then we can kind of go into the rest of what occurred. But those were the allegations that they were not yeah. caring for the kid. And they led with this, she should be in a home where she's accepted for who she is. 
Thank you, Josh, for summarizing that for us. I completely agree. This is a nightmare and nightmarish scenario for any parent, uh, particularly religious parents who love their kids and want what's best for them and, and know them better than anyone else, as most parents do. Um, this is very much the, the future that I think the radical left would like to see in our societies, a future where if parents do not you know, affirm a child's subjective sense of gender identity, they could lose custody over this. So this is sobering and I appreciate you telling that to our audience graciously while not mincing words. Uh, I wanna note for our, audience, for our audience that the name of this case is MC and JC versus Indiana Department of Child Services. I know there are some legal wonks that follow our podcast, so I wanna make sure I give them all the information they need to follow along. So Josh, my follow up here then is because obviously what, uh, uh, like you said, they removed the child from his parents' custody. What were specifically the legal grounds by which they justified that action? Sure. So under Indiana law, and you'd have similar juvenile statutes in, in every state in the country, um, we call it child in need of services under Indiana law. And so there would be an allegation that a parent would be neglecting or abusing a child. This was specifically that the parents had neglected the child by not referring to him uh, using those name that the preferred name and pronouns. Now, after a five month investigation, the state admitted they came back, the state came back and admitted that Mary and Jeremy had not abused or neglected their child in any way. Uh, so this was, you know, the state full investigation of their home came back and declared Mary and Jeremy are the legal term is fit parents. They have ne not neglected or abused him in any way. And so at, at that point, the parents expected their child to be put back in their home. You've declared us to be fit parents. But in, in that particular hearing, the state had said, look, Mary and Jeremy are fit parents. We believe that the child is engaged in self-endangering behavior, refusing to recognize an eating disorder, claiming that being put back in his loving family's home would worsen men his mental health condition. And so the, the parents agreed, yes, he, the child is, is self-endangering. Children do best with their loving mom and dad. And at the, the next hearing, the parents were surprised when the state came back and said, well, actually, there's still a reason he needs to be kept out because the disagreement over transgenderism is going to cause is not it's not in his best interest to be put back in his parents home so even after the state found that mary and jeremy cox are fit parents the state continued the removal of their child from their home continued the bar on their speech while encouraging speech from a different viewpoint and unfortunately and this is really even to talk about it to me is still gut-wrenching um, he was in fact never returned to their home he was kept out for over two years, eventually aging out of the foster care system without ever being placed back in their home. Oh, it's just stunning, Josh. It's really amazing to hear as a, a family attorney like you. You know, I remember sitting in family law class in law school and, and, and uh, learning that usually when, when the state itself makes a finding that parents are fit, usually that means they're good to go. They're going to get their kid back. And in this case, it didn't happen. And that's uh, seems to be because of some level of ideological capture there, which is a concern for you know, our socially conservative audience. And it's just shocking stuff. It should be very sobering. And I'm so grateful to you for uh, making us aware of it, raising awareness about this, then engaging on it. And uh, before I ask about that, I want to I start with, I know there are some, there's uh, at least one other legal action surrounding this case and a couple of legislative actions that are related to it. So could you tell us about that? Tell us about the other legal actions related to it and uh, any legislation uh, related to it. Yes, and so the, the parents have independently sued the caseworkers in this case, saying that the caseworkers, and in fact, lied, They're, the allegations in the complaint that the caseworkers lied about their family, that they were not treating an eating disorder, when in fact, uh, they had informed them that they were following their doctor's recommendations, that they had already scheduled an appointment with a specialist. And so that is an ongoing federal case saying that you can't, you can't just lie about parents without there being some consequence there, at least civilly. Um, the other actions that have been taken is that the Indiana legislature has considered a bill both in the uh, 22 um, legislative session as well as the 2020, or sorry, 2023 legislative session as well as 2024 that would have addressed these sorts of situations. One bill would have simply said that referring to or raising your child according to their biological sex is not neglect or abuse, period. And it just would have made sure that this does not occur. Uh, another legislative um, proposal was that in 
a case where a child is self-endangering, that that child could not be removed from a home unless there is parental consent. And that harkens back to our parental rights um, jurisprudence, Joseph, I'm sure that you're, you're familiar with, that, that helped me sleep at night, um, knowing that the state cannot come in and take my child unless they can prove that I have in some way abused or neglected them. And so we're, we're just asking that the, the court come in as we've appealed it now to the Supreme Court, we've asked the court to just come in and strengthen, uh, just recommit to those parental rights. Yeah, I agree, Josh, because parental rights, we believe at FPA, are the backbone, not just of the family, but of our civilization, really. So it, this should be the first bit of real encouragement, I think, for our audience in this case, is that there are people in the legal and legislative realm who, who recognize this with the same alarm that you and I do, are doing things about it, including all of you at Indiana Family Institute or IFI, and we're thankful for that. And I'm glad this family is sticking up for, for their good name here and bringing this other legal, legal action. It's great. Um, I do want to ask just a quick follow up to that, to that Josh. What's, what's been the main, uh, what are some of the main messaging lines pushing back on these efforts to shore up parental rights? Because these seem like common sense efforts. Like everybody, no matter what your general political persuasion is, you know, generally polling wise shows that parent, people agree that parents know their kids best they're generally the best place for their kids to thrive. So how does anyone argue against that? What have you seen so far there? So some of the main arguments that we've, we've heard um, from the other side, and, and I do recognize that we, we have a serious opioid and other drug addiction crisis in, in the United States. And I think what may happen in the course of, of a family law court is if, if you see that type of situation where you do have parents that have neglected or abused a child and they aren't taking account for their children, that it can be easily easy to try to, to just kind of lump cases together. But I, I do believe that's a, a juvenile court's job uh, to be able to discern between what is an individual or parent that is neglecting or abusing and a parent um, that is fit and actually doing everything necessary for that child. So I think there is just some general um, lack of respect for parental rights that's been developing uh, due to that. The other issue that certainly has been telling, and we've seen this in, in public schools, I'm sure the audience is familiar with these gender support plans, where a, a child can go to a school and in cases have been able to just tell the school, look, I, I identify as a gender different than my biological sex, and now don't tell my parents. And that public school employees have essentially been barred from sharing that information with the parents. And so there's this idea of like student privacy that that somehow the school would not be sharing the, that information with the most important people in that child's life. And so that is a, a very troubling development, but I think it, it reflects on uh, to this case as well. Yeah, I completely agree, Josh. I mean, uh, all the social science data shows that children thrive best when their parents are involved in these decisions. And that's part of why um, parental rights includes these decisions. Parents have a, the constitutional right to direct the upbringing of their, of their children. It includes medical uh, decisions um, like what we would call social transitioning, which is when um, you know a child struggling with gender dysphoria um, has begun down that, that dangerous path. Now, we believe every child is made in the image of God and God doesn't put anybody in the wrong body. But the point is that parental rights require that parents are involved with those decisions mm -hmm. from the very earliest stage and throughout all of it. So thank you for summarizing that for our audience. I completely agree. Um, I want to just get a sense for or draw out how unprecedented this is in, in Indiana. Uh, has anything like this ever happened in the Hoosier state before? No. And this is the first case of its kind um, that went in front of the Indiana Court of Appeals. And it's as an attorney, you may uh, have some recollection of, of this as well or, or some experience with this as well as you have a case and you're looking for the the precedent that you can cite as to why, you know, how does this supposed to play out in Indiana law? There's just, there, there were certainly not other uh, parental rights cases and just very few cases dealing with transgenderism. And so we, we ended up appealing this case to the Indiana court of appeals. Uh, once we got that order saying, look, you're fit parents, the child's endangered himself, but we're still going to keep him out. Uh, we appealed that to the Indiana court of appeals. And unfortunately that court compounded the constitutional violations by saying, look, you know, it's in the child's best interest to be out of the home. And this is exactly the standard that the U.S. Supreme Court says does not apply. You can't break up a natural family just if it's in the best interest of the child. Otherwise, you could have some a family with a ton of resources coming into a lower income family and say, well, we want your kid and we can do a better job. 
Um, so that's always protected parents. And then the other really, really troubling development from the Indiana Court of Appeals was it upheld the ban on the parents' religiously motivated speech to their own child and their own home. It said that it that bar or prior restraint on their speech um, actually survived strict scrutiny and even worse than that, that it was private speech that did not fully merit the protection of the First Amendment. When I read that, it just blew my mind. How, this, this completely violates the, the SCOTUS's free speech precedent and was one that I just, it was hard to read. I couldn't imagine that being there. We then appealed to the Indiana Supreme Court, asking them to take it up. Unfortunately, they did not uh, take the case. And so we then appealed out to the United States Supreme Court as this was a, a judgment of the, the final uh, Court of Appeals in the state of Indiana. So we've asked SCOTUS to intervene. Wow. This is truly an assault on two fundamental rights here between parental rights and religious freedom. Uh, it's unprecedented. It sounds like from what you're telling me, it seems like it to me from where I sit at the national level. And um, we've we've arrived in the brave new world that we've heard so much about. So um, all that reason to say I'm thankful for for what you're doing, Josh, and and for the lawyers on behalf of this family. And I'll, and I'll finish the podcast by asking you about that. But first, I want to make clear for our audience, because we have some really devout and praying people in this audience. And I think they want to know how they can pray about this case. So I want you to tell them what what are what are these parents? They've appealed their case to the Supreme Court. And we're hoping that the court will take it and make some kind of uh, definitive standard about this or definitive ruling about this kind of brave new world dispute when it comes to transgenderism versus our religious faith and parental rights. What are we hoping for exactly from SCOTUS and uh, what, what, what exactly from SCOTUS can our, can our audience pray for and hope for? Absolutely. And so as they pray, just wanted to emphasize that this is something that can happen anywhere. And the state of Indiana in one of their response brief has argued that the some of the case law and some of, or at least some of the statutes um, that are in play in this case are also in play in most, if not all US states. And now three states, um, according to our research, California, um, Washington, as well as Minnesota, and then have actually passed bills. And then at least two others, that would be Maine and Illinois, are considering bills that would say, if you do not provide quote unquote gender affirming care, you are in fact neglecting or abusing. So not just making this uh, a, a court case scenario, but making that the law of the state. So just understanding that scope and I appreciate the prayers. So what the family is asking the United States Supreme Court to do is to reverse um, the Court of Appeals decision and saying that, look, you cannot remove a, a child from a home if you find that parents are fit. And also that you can't bar parents from speaking about the entire topic of sex and gender with a child while affirming or allowing and enforcing speech from a different viewpoint. And this is critical because the, the parents still have other minor children in their home. They live in the same county and that we're afraid the state could come in and do the exact same thing. And this, the way that the order is written, it could be used to terminate the parental rights as to one of their other children. So it's critical that the U.S. Supreme Court uh, dive in and change this. I agree. And I, I hope and pray that they do, because I think anybody who loves the First Amendment from any political persuasion knows that the First Amendment's free speech provisions don't just apply to speech the government likes. They apply to all speech and uh, not just whether you're affirming someone or whether you're not. That's the point of the free speech and religious freedom pr uh, protections in there. So that's helpful, Josh. I appreciate it. We will be praying for the court to take that up and to make a wise decision that God's wisdom would be on them. Um, and I've been saying throughout this podcast, Josh, that we're so thankful for what you and the folks at Indiana Family Institute, IFI, are doing. I want to let our audience know that IFI is part of a network of, of about 40 of what we at FPA call State Family Policy Councils, or FPCs. Again, there's about 40 of them. There's more than likely to be one in your state. I encourage you to go to familypolicyalliance.com and click in the upper right-hand corner of the tab that says Allies and to connect with your state family policy council because they are the ones on the front line of issues like this in your state. And so, Josh, with that teed up for our audience, I want you to tell us what, what is IFI doing about this issue there and uh, tell us how folks can connect with you because you mentioned those, those bills from California and Minnesota and other places. Our FPC network has been instrumental in opposing those bills and preventing them from getting passed in other states like Maine. So, Josh, in regards to this case, what's IFI doing 
And uh, just as importantly, how can our audience connect with you guys and support you in your mission? Yeah, so uh, Indiana Family Institute has walked alongside uh, this family uh, from pretty much the beginning of this case, just you know, reaffirming the importance of parental rights, that this is this is unconstitutional, what's, what's going on. And if the listeners have ever been involved in a, a case against the government, I mean, this is a, a long drawn out affair. Um, and just having the, I, I'm so grateful for the family, the, the courage that they've shown, the, just the fortitude, the perseverance in, in appealing this case all the way up to SCOTUS. So HoosierFamily.org, HoosierFamily.org, I believe it's on the screen there. You can, you can see our efforts if uh, you're inclined to, to support our work. We certainly covet the prayers at this time. And I, I did want to note a, a very particular date. Um, and so March 15th, is the conference. So if you're familiar with how the Supreme Court operates, um, they have a conference where they'll consider petitions. Uh, cases before SCOTUS are, are discretionary. They can take them or not. Um, and so that's actually going to be occurring tomorrow on March 15th. So it's very timely. Uh, so would welcome, you know, please look us up HoosierFamily.org. Uh, we're on uh, Facebook as well as, as Twitter, now X. Uh, we'll certainly welcome your support there. Yes, we encourage our audience to do that for Indiana Family Institute, IFI. Do it for all of our FPCs that you find on our website. There's more than likely one in your state. And as I hope our audience has been able to see from, from this show, Josh, um, what's happening in Indiana, like you said, can happen anywhere. Because just because it's happening in Indiana doesn't mean it couldn't happen in your state. Red, blue, purple, whatever your situation is. And I want to just end by encouraging our audience that God is sovereign over every state. No matter what the political situation is. Um, God is sovereign over families and over what's going on. So uh, we cover your prayers. We're thankful for them. We're thankful for this to, the, uh, to this family for standing up for parents everywhere who are facing this new wave of assaults on parental rights from the transgender ideology. And Josh, we're just thankful to you for being alongside them throughout all of this and your exemplary work on behalf of the body of Christ and on behalf of social conservatives everywhere. Thank you for your time today. Thank you to our audience for joining. And uh, join us here again soon for the next edition of the SoCon Report podcast.